Hello everybody, John here, and today on to the garage, all we're doing is a quick catch up on a few bits and pieces, and I'm just sharing a blooper I made off camera. First thing, I made a brilliant purchase the other day. I went to an antiques place, um, not normally my bag, but quite interesting. And I purchased something rather random. Red Bull. <laughs> now this is Red Bull as in the drink rather than Formula One, same company, um, because it's a bar mat sort of thing that collects all the drips when you're pouring out your pints. But I thought, perfect for my bench when I'm doing smaller and more delicate things because it's got all these little grippy nodules, nothing's gonna fall or spill or roll off the bench and I can protect things and it looks pretty. So it's rather chuffed with my purchase. It's still all packaged up, obviously intended to be sent out to pubs and um, it cost me 10 pounds. So I'm gonna share that little treat with you. Next, it's also the 2nd of March, so time to say bye-bye to Matthew Gunn and his car, Ivory Misfire. And hello to Gerard Booth and his entry for this year's competition. Um, looking quite monochrome and actually looking chrome, but it hasn't been wrapped. Just artistic input from Gerard twiddling the knobs on his laptop, no doubt. Great shot again of a carnival red car looking like chrome. And I'd just like to stress the attention to detail that's gone into some of Gerard's shots. He's a Brit, you'll know, no number plates. And yet he's not outside his house. So he's driven there and removed the number plate and the number plate mounts just to make the car look pretty. Kudos, sir. So, Gerard Booze, 1996 in Carnival Red with side reflector delete, so no orange ellipses on the side, and it's at the slipway at Knot End, Fleetwood, England. While I'm doing the hellos, I want to give a big shout out to, to George Papas 6551 and uh, George thank you so much for your super thanks that's really generous very kind of you and um, as I said in my little message I'll buy a coffee on you thank you very much and if any of you out there want to do me a favor just subscribe to the channel it helps the algorithm that YouTube uses and therefore means to the garage comes up in more searches so I get more friends simple as that <laughs> So please subscribe. At this point, unfortunately, my microphone failed and I failed to notice it. But as you can see, for the first time in a long time, Purdy's out of the garage because the suspension's all back together. So I was able to do a little bit of tidying up and take her out for a drive. And she's looking nice and shiny in the evening sunlight. So we've got the uh, new strut tops in place. Uh, took them for a spin. Very pleased with those. Thank you very much, um, Peter. Um, enjoying the drive, and I will be keeping a track on, uh, you know, developments and do regular little shorts or something showing how centralised the shockers are. Um, I mentioned at the beginning of this video, I made a little blooper. Well, this is where the blooper came in. I had to do the other side off camera and I rushed a little bit, I must admit, in my excitement to get the car back on the road. And as you saw when we were building these strut tops, you clamp the shells together using nuts and bolts, wind them shut, then pop rivet the whole thing back together. Now, what's really important is you take those nuts off the studs and I reinstalled this strut with the nuts still intact 
and I spent ages staring at it, thinking, why doesn't it pull up properly? As a socket rolled off the, the inside of the car and gone down that gap and is jamming it. And of course, when I finally gave in and lowered the strut back out and started again, I realised I'd left the nuts on. So, um, yeah, remember to remove them. <laughs> I'll just take this opportunity to say hi to one of my new friends um, and call him Bongo Pete. Not because he plays the bongos, but because he drives a bongo, who I met recently on one of my uh, trips for work to a campsite in Derbyshire. Really nice to meet you, Pete. And I hope to cross paths with you at some point in the future and see how you get on with your ambulance build and conversion into a camper. In the last video I alluded to future videos incorporating some things in this box and of course people couldn't wait so um, yes I've got various things like drop links or anti-roll bar links, new ones for the front of my car which I want to install some bushes for the lower wishbones or control arms depending on your point of view on the front and probably most interestingly i have the bottom ball joints which i'm going to press in and out of my uh, lower control arms a job that most people avoid by buying new complete items uh, yeah it is a bit tricky and i shall enjoy working out how to do that one of the interesting messages I received recently was from a fellow subscriber who said, John, I'm trying to build up my toolkit. I want to get um, a torque wrench. What torque wrench or wrenches in terms of range would you recommend for the car? Um, so I thought I'd just re-answer this on video by saying I've actually got four, but that's quite excessive and because I enjoy tools, I think. For 90% of people, you want a decent half inch drive torque wrench. Mine's a Tang, but is of the sort of range 50 to 250 Newton meters. And that's going to cover you for most torquing jobs on the car. It won't go up high enough for some of the really heavy stuff so if you're doing the harmonic damper or crankshaft pulley on the front of the engine you're going to need a torque wrench that goes up to 350 plus but you're talking something quite expensive but you're net you're not going to use it more than once in the car's lifetime probably and there are a few jobs on rear hubs that need that sort of really heavy torque um Mine also has an angular setting on it, which is quite handy because some torques are specified as tighten to, let's say, 100 newton meters and then turn the nut an additional 10 degrees or 20 degrees. This is kind of deluxe having this feature on the torque wrench head so you can actually see the angles as well. But yeah, that's what I've got for my heavier uh, torque wrench <coughs> excuse me in addition I think if you've got a Jag particularly um, I would say get a really light torque wrench so so I've got a quarter inch drive one which is in the range 5 newton meters to 25 newton meters um, the reason for having this is we've having so many plastics on our cars and I mean under the bonnet things like uh, intake manifolds etc it's nice to know you're not over tightening things so some of the light torques it's nice to have a nice precise one of those uh, mine's branded Premier but I'm almost certain it's a Sealy it's just badge engineered and it's got this sliding collar which is quite nice it's it's a way of locking the handle being a really light torque wrench it's quite easy to adjust the torque whilst you're cranking on it and that locks it on the heavy torque wrench i've got a thumb wheel that locks 
the thimble, but it's really heavy anyway, so you'd be unlikely to accidentally move those things. So that'd be my recommendation. Get two like that, and if you need something heavier, hire it or borrow it. In my previous video, although extolling the virtues of my twisting head pistol pop riveter, I also plainly struggled to close up the relatively chunky rivets using it. So when it came to doing the second side, I actually got these out and used those. They, they're sort of a bolt cropper style of pop riveter. Um, obviously you got much better leverage. It was really easy to do with this type of tool, but for most automotive jobs, you won't have the access space to have those big handles moving in and out like that. Because this is on the bench, it's you know straightforward and it's a good choice of tool. So that's another option. If you're gonna do this job and um, you've got access to this sort of tool, I would say get a hold of one of these. Finally, um, I had a lot of questions after completing the shock mount saga on John just explain again which mounts have you got are your shells Welsh are they OE are they uh, Euro what I need to say is I do not know who made my mounts um, equally I can say they're the same depth of pressing as the ones I took out which I believed were original equipment, but they're at least 12 years old. I, they may be aftermarket as well. So I don't know which um, pressings I have fitted my bushes into, but I did fit the shorter option in terms of the bushes. So one longer and one shorter one. And many of you needed some detail on that, not least a uh, resident a biographer and detailer of this stuff. Gary Van Remortel, who creates the XK8 Bible. Go check that out. It's available via my website if you want to have a look at it. And so for Gary, as much as for anybody else, here's a little bit of video that did have some sound on. The shallower, probably Euro uh, dishes. If we put depth, To the main seating face, it is 34.5 millimeters. That's to this surface. Well, that's all for now, folks. I will give you some regular update videos showing how I'm getting on with the new shock mounts, but good so far, and um, indicate the ride height as it changes. Thanks very much. Bye. If you're enjoying our channel, then don't forget to subscribe and click the little bell icon so you get notifications of new videos. And please give us a thumbs up or thumbs down and you can share the videos. And below the video is always the area where you can comment and get involved with the chat.